I'm Jen. I'm a senior front end engineer at a company called ClassPass. Uh, we're based out of New York. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or see the slides after this talk, they're going to be at Girl Code. That's my handle. Um, so I really love React. Um, I'm really, honestly, like a diehard fan <laughs> of React. Um, it's the first framework that I started working with that really aligned with how I wanted to build front end. So when I started thinking of this talk about you know, what I wanted to share about building flexible components and what I've learned over four plus years of working with React, um, I knew the how of this talk really well. That's the technical side of this talk. But what I was forced to articulate was the why. Um, so why I was doing the things that I was doing. I sort of knew intuitively why I was doing these things, but actually like sitting down and writing them out is a very different experience. So to start, I want to start with, you know, why do we care if a component is flexible and what does flexible even mean? So in terms of building UI, I often hear flexible uh, equate with uh, reusable. Um, so an example of this would be, you know, if you're building a UI component, it doesn't really matter what it is at the moment, so I'm just gonna represent it with a block. Okay, so you have your block. Uh, four sides, four corners, it's built. Everything's going really smoothly. So when you get a new design that has that same UI element, you feel pretty good because you've already built the block. I mean, these are all different colors, but that's really easy to change. Everything shares the same structure and functionality as that first block that we built. So we can reuse it. And we might think of that as a flexible component. Except something did change about this component. So some functionality was added to this last one. Um, so sometimes it's got a tooltip, um, so it's different. Okay, we can handle this. We're gonna just add a with tooltip prop to this. Okay, and that will signify that there's a tooltip. Um, so, so things are still okay. Oh, then we get another mock. Now the block could have a dot in it. Okay, so we'll add a with dot prop. We'll handle that, that's fine. We can still reuse our block. Oh, okay, another requirement, okay. So we're gonna add another prop. So is this component flexible? I mean, it's being reused. Um, we can change what UI it represents with a prop. So this seems really flexible. But let's imagine that some time has gone by and we've stopped working on the component, but our coworkers are working with it instead. It's a reusable component after all, and the changes are just a little bit here and a little bit there. And you know, why rewrite this when we already have this functionality somewhere? I mean, we could just add some more props and get this to work for our use case now. And don't forget that we also want to add some A-B testing, so let's add that in. I mean, that's all temporary. We're pretty sure it's temporary. Um, ah, <laughs> the prop collapse. The dreaded, dreaded apocalypse. Our simple block component is now overrun with props. So what now? Is this component still flexible? Nothing has changed about its reusability. It's still handling multiple UI cases based on what props you provide it. But I'd argue that this isn't a flexible component and that our idea of reuse can sometimes blind us to better, more flexible patterns. So I've dealt with a component like this before, and I'd guess most of us have. Blessings upon you if you have not. May you never have to. Uh, the example I use about the block component is actually like verbatim to a real component in the class pass code base. Um, we call it the schedule CTA. Um, so how many of you know what class pass is? Oh, some of you, cool. Uh, we are in Richmond actually. Um, but if you don't know what we are, we are a membership that allows you to book fitness classes at different studios in your location. So the majority of our UI is comprised of fitness classes. So we're gonna see, show a lot of schedules on our site. And every schedule comes with a CTA attached to it. So that's how you actually interact with that class schedule. Uh, most of the time, if you're a logged in user, you're gonna be using that CTA to actually reserve the class. But the CTA is actually a very surprisingly complex component 
Um, it's one of our key components on the site, too, because it's how you interact with all the schedules. And it has five states, actually. I'm only showing three up here, but it has five. So if you're viewing schedules as a logged out user, you're gonna see a join message, so that's gonna prompt you to sign up for ClassPass. Um, and if you're logged in, you're gonna see one of three different messages. Um, so either the credits, how much it's gonna cost from the subscription credits that you get each month to book the class, um, or you've already booked the class, so now you need to cancel the class, or for some reason, um, you're gonna show a disabled CTA, which means that they can't reserve that class for whatever reason. Usually it's that you have a conflicting uh, schedule at that same time. Um, and then if you've previously had a ClassPass membership um, and then you left us, but you wanna reactivate, you're actually going to see the reactivate call to action. And then it also has three different behaviors. So it might show a modal, uh, it might link to another page, or it might actually show the tooltip. And then this is all the data that I need to correctly determine which CTA I'm going to show. Um, so is the user logged in, yes or no? What's the state of the user subscription? Are they subscribed, unsubscribed? Did they cancel? Um, and then I need to know the state of the class. Is it available? Is it unavailable? Did you already reserve it? So this is already like a lot of information. And when I joined ClassPass, the schedule CTA already existed. So I first encountered it when I needed to implement it on a new page. And you can see as I scroll down that this is really complex for a button. Like, it's just a button. <laughs> but uh, it, the scrolling is just gonna keep going. Um, and if anyone can figure out like what the heck is going on with this code from this first glance, like, bless you. Um, you know, I couldn't tell when I first encountered this what was happening. There's if-else statements in there, there's a switch statement, there's various functional components, and the history of this component is identical to the block component. Um, so it was created with an initial, like, scope of just being, like, a button that you click on to reserve a class. And then from there, like, more intricacies got laid on top. You know, a tooltip was added, links to other page, permission checks for various A-B tests, and various designs based off of the state. So by the time that I needed to implement this component, it required 14 props. 14 props! <laughs> like, no matter the use case, you needed to pass in 14 props for this component to work. And God help you if you forget a prop. Or worse, you need to add or remove a type of CTA or behavior. So is this component flexible? The thing is, you can write reusable components that are inflexible. Reusable doesn't equal flexible. Yes, the schedule CTA is reusable, but what happens when it needs to change? Which prop can I safely take away? Which prop is needed for what UI state? These questions are actually really difficult to answer because the component itself is really difficult to understand. Oh, thank you. Um, and if you can't understand it and you can't safely modify it, is it flexible? I would argue that flexibility is about more than reusability. It's about the ability to understand and augment. To me, that's true flexibility. I don't care if your component is only used in one place on the site you know, if it has these qualities about it, then I consider it flexible. The opposite, unable to be understood, unable to be modified, these things make a component inherently inflexible. But now, I need to stop talking about what I mean, and I need to show you what I mean. So we're going to refactor the schedule CTA, and we're going to start with, hands down, the best starting point for either writing a new component or refactoring one we're going to write down our ideal API. So React is declarative, and this is awesome, because we can start from a point of not how we're going to create this component, but what it should look like. This is a really important part of building a truly flexible component. Often we focus on how we'll make a component reusable when we should be starting with what it should look like. And then we're going to let that inform how we implement it. 
So for example, the schedule CTA. Um, if we focus on how we're going to render these different CTAs, then we're going to end up on the path that we've just been down. Um, if else statements, a switch statement, and all of that is imperative, not declarative. So let's focus on what we want it to look like. Our ideal API is one prop, the type. Yet that's the entire job of this component. I give it a type and it gives me back the appropriate CTA. And this is a significant change for this component. And I don't mean in the number of props that have been passed in. We've made a fundamental change in the structure of this component because we've pulled the logic out of it. So previously, the schedule CTA decided what CTA to show. It was in charge of that. It relied on those 14 props because it needed all of those props to run its internal logic and render the correct UI. And this is a problem for some very good reasons. If you add business logic to a component, you've locked that component. It can't be reused with a different set of rules. Which means you need to understand the logic to use the component or to change the component. And if you want to change the logic, you're probably going to add more props, a props list. So by removing the business logic from our components, we're going to gain some flexibility. We can understand and we can augment with much more ease. And we can also reuse the component with different logic. So since our ideal API removes the need for all that embedded logic, I've pulled it out into a separate function. So we no longer need 14 props for this. Prop calypse avoided. Um, plus, we benefit from centralizing our logic, which is easier to reason about. And we can test our components separately from the logic. Now, I know it's nice to have a drop-in component that just does it all for you. Um, that can be really great sometimes, maybe. I mean, magic can be a really lovely thing. Um, something that just works can be really wonderful. But I want you to think about the level of magic, you know, what you're aiming for. Do you want a rabbit in a hat, or do you want a vanishing elephant? Like, one of those tricks, we know how it works, and the other one, like, I don't, I don't know how to vanish an elephant. Um, you don't want so much magic that the engineer can't figure out what's going on you know, the more magic, the less flexible the component is going to be. And since the schedule CTA is really vital to our site, I want very little magic. Um, that's part of why I chose this API. Uh, I wanna give the engineer who uses this, like, some clue about what's going on here. So give the schedule CTA a type, get back a CTA. But I also want a simpler API because I'm aiming for engineers to use this component. I want them to be able to safely navigate it, and I want to not be kicking myself for code I won't be able to understand after a few months of not looking at it. Okay, so now we know our ideal API, and now we kind of have to decide also the structure of the individual CTAs. And we have a couple of options here. So option one, we can use a base CTA component, and we're going to change out the messaging and props based off the type of CTA. And option two, we can write each CTA as a separate component, so we would have like a reserve CTA, a cancel CTA, so on and so forth. So if you're leaning towards option one, uh, you might be thinking that all the CTAs look similar and you could get some reuse out of a base component. Um, so it's less duplication of code, one place to update, and that all sounds good. But each of these CTAs needs to be modified depending on the type. So for example, the join CTA is a link, uh, but the reserve CTA is a button. So are we headed for another issue with this, trying to reuse one component for all of these? If you're leaning towards option two, you might be thinking that since the CTAs don't share all of the same UI or behavior, it makes sense to break them out into separate components. You'll know where to make changes, and you can isolate behavior to a particular CTA. 
but you're gonna see some duplication of code. So you might need to update each component at some part, point and like that's a real pain. Um, to be honest, I don't think there's a right answer here and a wrong answer here. I just think that there's options with upsides and downsides. And ultimately, what I chose to do was to combine a little bit of option A and a little bit of option B and get a third option, A, B, C. You know what I mean. Um, so I want a base component that handles some of the common UI. But I want to break out the CTAs into their own components so I can specify some behavior. So this is the base CTA component. And I want it to be really lightweight because its main job is just to encapsulate the things that might change more frequently. Um, so like the class name. Um, and I also really need it to not interfere with the differences between these CTAs. Like the fact that you know, some CTAs are buttons and others are links via React Router and others are actually A tags. Um, so a couple of things I'm doing in this component, I'm taking advantage of ES6 defaults here, and I'm going to assign the button as the tag to use. Um, but any specific CTAs that need a link or an A tag can override that. Um, I like this because I get to encapsulate the most commonly used tag type, which is the button. Um, and when we override it, it's going to be clear in the CTA that we're passing along a very specific prop. I'm also going to be relying on the children prop to render the different CTA messages. Children is super useful for when you need a generic container to take in more specific child components. So very quick example if you're just unfamiliar with children. Uh, this is a bread component. It'll be our generic container. And then I can put whatever I want between those bread slices. So the bread is the generic container. Uh, everything that's put between that will be given as the children prop to the bread component later. So I can be very specific with my children. Now, alternatively to the children prop, we could have passed in a message prop. Um, but I actually find this less useful for this type of component. Um, one thing at ClassPass is we use React International and some other uh, libraries so that for these various messages, um, I'm actually passing in a component, um, not a string. And when you're doing something like that, passing in a component uh, via a prop, I, I would urge you to consider using the children prop instead. Um, it's more flexible and a declarative option. Um, so you can change the children components, the internals of the container, and it doesn't need to change the container itself. So for our use cases in the schedule CTA, we only need to know that whatever we wrap the base CTA around will be available as the children prop. So here I'm wrapping a formatted message component from React International to show the credits it costs to reserve a class. Um, so we're taking that generic container, wrapping it in over specific children, um, and then I can also be very specific about other things in this component. Um, so you'll notice, for instance, uh, this is a reserved CTA, so it uses the button primary class name. And I can be very specific in this component that that's what it should be using. And I can also make sure I have very specific behavior, not just UI stuff. So the disable CTA isn't meant to do anything. Um, when you see the disable CTA, it means you can't reserve the class and you're not allowed to click on the button. So what I get to do here is I get to ensure that even if an on-click handler is accidentally past the disable CTA, I'm overriding it with this on-click handler that does nothing. Um, so you know, as an engineer, this is really great because I can specify UI and behavior per component. Uh, so when the join CTA needs special analytics tracking, I can do that without touching anything else. And since the reserve CTA needs to open a modal, I can do that, and I don't need to worry about accidentally introducing a change to another CTA. Uh, I can test all of these individual CTAs for the specific behavior for them, um, and changes to the CTAs are isolated to that component. We've also added some flexibility that wasn't there before. Um, so now we can use the CTAs alone. 
so this is an example of our upcoming classes page, uh, which just shows all the classes that you've reserved. So we don't actually need the schedule CTA in its entirety here. We actually just need the cancel CTA, because you've reserved all these classes. I don't need to run the logic at all for any of this. Uh, you're already logged in at this point, and I know that you've reserved the class. But previously, with the old schedule CTA, you actually still had to pass in all those props. Um, you couldn't pull out the individual CTA that you wanted to use, because you were relying on the schedule CTA to pass you back something correctly. And again, it wouldn't work without all 14 props. So now that we've chosen to separate these out into individual ones, I can actually take an individual CTA and put it somewhere. Wasn't able to do this before. Um, now I can do these things and not have to worry about 14 props. Okay, so we have our base CTA. We're using that to create the individual CTA components. But we also have the schedule CTA, and it's not complete yet. Um, we're giving it a type, and we have individual CTAs, but we need to figure out how the schedule CTA knows which to return. Now, we could use a switch statement inside the schedule CTA to return the correct CTA. I mean, that's completely valid. Um, but looking at our ideal API, I think I see a better option. We give the schedule CTA a type and it gives us something back. And that reminds me a lot of requesting a key from an object. So let's use that pattern. We'll create an object with keys and values that correspond to the type and its component. Now we're going to use the type prop to grab the correct component to render. If you're wondering why I'm assigning this to a component with a capital C, React allows you to dynamically render components, but the component needs to be capitalized. Um, that allows React to tell the difference between a built-in component, uh, like a div or a span, and a user-defined component, like our uh, CTAs. And dynamic um, component names are a really nice method of just cutting down on switch and if statements uh, in your component. So here, I'm using this to determine which sidebar to show using an ES6 template string. And then here, I'm using this to decide if I'm gonna wrap my content um, or not. Um, so these are just, like, it's a nice little trick that I use a lot. Okay, so this is actually the schedule CTA after our refactor. You'll notice it's a lot smaller. There is no scrolling happening here. Um, so we're using the uh, object pattern to grab the correct type that we want. Um, if no type was provided to us, we're just gonna return null, we, we shouldn't be rendering anything. Um, other words, we're going to grab it from the object and then we're going to pass along the rest of the props into that component. So, uh, actually, I forgot about this. Type, we get the type. If not, we return null. We're gonna get the component and then we're going to get the props and pass it in. I forgot I had all these nice animations for you. Um, so all those remaining props are gonna get passed in. So we can pass along like a whole bunch of other props. Um, but you might be wondering, what do you mean other props? Like it was just the one prop, what are you doing? Um, so we have the ideal API, and that was just the one prop, the type. Um, but as you start building these things out, you're going to realize what's a more realistic API for you. Um, so just right off the bat, I can tell you, like, I'm gonna need to be able to pass a class name in because someone's gonna wanna modify this at some point to do something, right? So probably need to pass that in. And there might be other props that as I started to build this out, I was like, oh, I actually need to pass this in. I can't get away with just having just the type there. So you start with the ideal API and then you move into the realistic API. And this is the realistic API. So this is what we ended up with. Um, so we've gone from 14 props to four. Um, most of the CTAs need some schedule information um, because we do a lot of analytics information. So a lot of them do need like the class ID and that stuff. And then I chose to pull the tooltip out. So we might need a tooltip or not, um, but that's gonna be given on the outside, not determined logically on the inside. And so after this refactor, we can use whatever logic we want with the schedule CTA now. 
we're not beholden to one set embedded in it. Uh, we can use those individual CTAs alone. And I can add and remove CTAs actually with much more ease because I'm dealing with that object in the schedule CTA. It's honestly a matter of just going in there and adding or removing a CTA from that object for if I want to show it or not. So I can really quickly add and remove A-B testing components very easily there. And then, you know, I did this big refactor, but was it worth it? Yes. I mean, this is actually everything that happened to that component since I refactored it. Um, we had uh, CTAs added and removed for A-B tests. Um, we actually removed the disable CTA on some pages, so I had to change the logic on some pages. Uh, we went through a rebranding, so actually all of our class names changed. Um, the messaging changed for the reserve CTA, that went through a big uh, refactor. And we actually had very specific asks for specific CTAs on specific pages, um, which I could do now with those alone, like standalone CTAs. So completely worth all the time it took for me to re-architect this and make it more flexible. All right, so we finished the schedule CTA, um, but I wanna keep going. Um, so I wanna work on a nicer option for all of this business logic that we pulled out during the first part of our refactor. Um, right now, it, it's all in a function. Uh, so if you wanna use this with the schedule CTA, you also have to know that you need to import this function. Um, so this is really low magic, but high annoyance. Like, it's just annoying to always have to pull in this function when I wanna use it. And I want the right level of magic. Um, so, to do this, I'm going to show you one of my favorite React patterns, the render props pattern. It's also known as children as a function. Uh, so, I spoke about the children prop earlier, and while that prop can be children components that you're passing into a generic container, it can also be, honestly, anything. Uh, so the children prop, you could pass in an object, you can pass in an array, a string, a number, you can pass in a function, hint, hint. Um, so if we pass in a function as the children, we get to do some cool stuff. We can do something like this. Don't worry if this doesn't make sense right now. Um, the first time I saw this pattern, it was not immediately clear to me what was going on. Um, and then later I was like, I, I love this so much. Uh, so, what's happening here? Um, so this is a function uh, that we pass as the children to the get schedule CTA component. It's going to expect a type to be passed into that function, and then it's going to supply that type to the schedule CTA. Inside the get schedule CTA component, um, we're going to use uh, get schedule type. That would be that function that I pulled all the logic out into. So we're gonna call that and it's going to return to us the type. You can imagine that I'm passing in a bunch of stuff to it. Um, so that's gonna calculate the CTA type for us. And then once we get that, we're actually going to use that function that we got as the children and we're going to call it. And now we're gonna pass in the type. Um, so that's how the render props pattern just generally works. Uh, you pass in a function as the children component, and that prop is called with the information it needs from the parent component. And this is a really powerful pattern. Uh, you can separate out a component uh, that handles logic from the actual rendering of the UI. So with render props, you delegate the rendering to the, children fu to the child function. Um, so it can return whatever UI it wants to based off of the information that it's received from the parent. And so for the schedule CTA, I'm gonna use this as just a really nice option to create declarative logic around the component. And I can export the schedule CTA wrapped in its logic. So this avoids the need to import like a separate function. And render props isn't a new pattern. Um, it's gained a lot of traction recently. In fact, even though it's been used in libraries like React Motion and React International for quite a while now, um, it only now has official docs on reactjs.org. And if you wanna see the full potential of the render props pattern, I recommend the Downshift library. It's by Kent C. Dodds. It's an auto-complete library. It is 
the first time I actually ever heard of render props, he started really talking about it uh, as part of this library. We actually use this autocomplete library as, at work as well. Definitely tr like check it out if you want to see like the full measure of what you can do with render props. Um, but of course, I want to caution that render props is just one tool in the toolbox. So I'm often very guilty of seeing a pattern, falling in love with it, and then wanting to apply it to everything. <laughs> um, someone gives me a new tool and I think everything is a nail. Um, that's just me. But maybe it's also you. Um, so this brings me to the part of the talk that I hadn't really expected to write um, I thought this talk would be mostly technical, but in some cases, you know, the why of building flexible UI isn't tied to the technical. Um, it's tied to how you approach code as an engineer and how that impacts what you write. Um, okay, so I had this ongoing joke with a friend of mine. He loves lifting things. And I know that sounds really weird, but he lifts like Olympic weights as one of his hobbies. And he loves lifting like anything heavy. Um, like if you were to take a heavy dumbbell and just put it in front of him, he'd be like, oh my God, I'm gonna go lift that up. I'm like, why are you doing this? Um, literally anything heavy, he's like, I could, I could lift that. You're like, okay. He's lifted people before. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I started this joke with him where I was like, I could actually like trap you so easily. Like I just put out a heavy dumbbell and like you're gonna go for it. Um, nothing's gonna make, make you think like, oh, I shouldn't go do that. Like why would a heavy dumbbell be on the street? And then I could just like throw a net on you and catch you. Like it's so simple. Um, and so we started this joke of like know your traps. Um, it's important to know your traps. Like what if placed in front of you on the sidewalk would you just instinctively go for without even thinking and like you could be trapped really easily. Um, the, and the more I thought about this, the more I was like, yeah, it's a funny joke with my friend, but it's also how I feel about engineering. Um, you actually need to know your traps as an engineer. I mean, my trap is that I see a new pattern like this and I wanna use it for everything. Um, I, I get like that. I love patterns very much. Um, so if you're like me and you like a pattern and you keep reusing it, or maybe your trap is actually that you don't go learn new patterns. Maybe you just like keeping with the set that you have and you don't ever branch out. I mean, all of these are traps and they're gonna keep you from building better components. And then once you've built those components, are you willing to kill them? So my background a long time ago actually now is that I was actually a creative writing major. Um, I went to school for creative writing. And kill your darlings is a very popular saying in the creative writing community. So essentially what it means is if you've written a story or a poem and some part of it isn't working, you have to be willing to kill it. So if you've written a story and you wrote in a character that you personally love, but it's actually not working for your narrative, kill it. If you wrote a particular sentence in a poem that again, you just love, but it's not working for the whole thing, kill it. And you have to be willing to do that. I know as an engineer, I actually feel very attached to the things that I write, even though it's just bits, like I, it's nothing more than that, but I feel like my components are my babies. And sometimes they don't work out. And instead of being like, yeah, yeah, I'll kill it, it's just not working. I try to hold on too tight. I'm like, no, no, we can make this work. We can definitely make this work. Um, we don't need to rewrite this. We don't need to refactor this. I built this. I know this. I can, I can do this. No. Um, it's better if you realize that when things aren't working, you can kill it and that your components aren't your babies and that things a long time like need to be refactored and need to be rethought out. All of the work that I did for the schedule CTA, as much as that's working for us now, it might not work for us in the future and I have to be willing to destroy all of it. So, here's a summary of everything we've learned in this talk, surprisingly a lot when I wrote out this summary sheet. Um, we learned to start with our ideal API. We're gonna build out the more realistic API as you go along. 
Um, we're going to let that API inform the component design. And we're going to decide what level of magic we want up front. Uh, we need to know how much we want engineers to be able to figure this thing out or not. Um, business logic, you should be removing it from your components. It makes things way easier. Render props is really awesome. You should definitely use it. But please remember, be flexible as an engineer as well. Know your traps and kill your darlings. Thank you.